So we're, we're coming to the end of this kind of quite big section of teaching that began in, at the beginning of chapter 11. And, and in this section, Jesus has been teaching us all about what real life is, how to be truly human, um, where real life is found. And we finished last time in Luke with Jesus telling us not to worry. Do you remember? Don't be anxious. Don't worry about where your food will come from. Don't worry about your clothing. Why? Because life isn't found in those things. Life isn't found in, in material things. Your life is found in God. So we might think, great. Don't worry, just chill. Right? Well, in this next passage, Jesus gives us some important balance to that instruction not to worry. Because we could take Jesus' um, take Jesus' words out of context to mean that he doesn't want us to be concerned with anything. But Jesus isn't saying that. Jesus isn't a hippie, right? You know, just live your life, man, be cool, and everything will just work out. He's not saying that. There are some Christians who speak and live as though that is what he's saying. You know, just be chill, coast through life, don't really concern yourself with anything, just enjoy life and your Heavenly Father will take care of everything. But that's not faithfulness, that's laziness. When Jesus says, don't be anxious, he's not saying, don't care about anything. He's saying, care about the right things. Don't, don't care, don't worry about the wrong things, but he does want us to care deeply about the right things. And so he says in verse 35, we kick off this passage with, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. He's saying, be ready. That doesn't really sound like a kind of chill, hippie sort of vibe, does it? Sounds more like a guard, a commander. Stay dressed for action. He's been telling us to take our eyes off of the things of the world. He's saying, don't be concerned with all this stuff, all this money and progress and modernity and all this stuff. And now he shifts our emphasis onto what we positively should be watchful for. I wonder, do you recognise that you are watchful? Do you recognise that you are on the lookout for things? What are you watchful for? What are you on the lookout for? What are you vigilant about? Um, maybe, you know, it's like not too many carbohydrates. Maybe it's dairy. Maybe uh, it's chemicals in your food that you worry about. Maybe it's the weather or interest rates or fuel prices that you're always on the lookout for. What do you, what do you check your phone for through the day? Social media updates, messages from friends, uh, clothes on sale, that dispatch notice for the thing you've been waiting for from Amazon, uh, news, politics, your bank balance. What are you vigilant about? When we stop and think about it, we, we, we constantly have things on our mind that we're looking out for and that we make life decisions based on. What takes up most of your time and thoughts? What are you concerned about? And is it the place that Jesus wants your focus to be? Because Jesus has been telling us, hasn't he, throughout this whole section, that he's coming back. He's going to return. And when he does, that will be it. That will be the end of days. The day of the Lord. The day when he comes to judge the living and the dead, as we've confessed in our confession this morning. And all in him will be safe. And all who have rejected him will be lost. And so the question is, knowing this, how do we live? You see, church life is all about knowing and believing that there is something more to come. And so the question is, what are we going to do while we wait? What are our priorities going to be? When we understand what is coming, how does it change how we live today? You see, this text that we just read this morning from Luke isn't an evangelistic text, not primarily. Yes, the saying is universal to all people. You know, the question, will you be ready 
for when Jesus returns? That is a question that every single person must and will grapple with. And if they don't grapple with it today, then they will grapple with it on the day when he returns. So that is true. In that sense, this is obviously for everyone. But the specific issue in this text is the readiness of those who are already in the master's house. Do you see that? All the characters here in the parable are already a part of the master's house. And yet, some of them end up blessed and some of them end up cursed, cut to pieces. Some are brought into eternal life and others are sent to eternal death. Verse 46. I guess my point is in saying this is don't think, well obviously I'm ready. This passage isn't for me. It's for me to take to my neighbour, my unbelieving friends. Because I'm a Christian. I said the prayer once. And then you carried on being consumed by the world and its priorities. The question is, what kind of Christian are you? Are you awake this morning? Or are you sleeping? Now, fortunately, it doesn't mean like physically awake, because there's a lot of us here who are pretty tired. But are you really awake to what's going on in the world? Are you doing the work of Jesus while you wait for him? Are you trusting in him? Or are you being lazy? This matters because as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let's take a look, a closer look at this parable. It starts in verse 36. Jesus says, be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Because blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. So this is a really interesting um, parable for us because it's very different to our culture. So in this time and culture, weddings were very seldom just a, a single day affair. There, there would normally be a party that goes on for several days, maybe even a week. So the master's gone and they don't know exactly when he's going to be back. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow, it could be tomorrow night, it could be three days from now. And it's the servant's job during that time to keep the household running whilst he was gone. Now, we're not just talking about, you know, a maid who come in and fluff the pillows and clean the windows. This is an agrarian culture, a farming culture. Uh, and clearly this is a big household because we later on we hear about managers over, over other servants. And so what we see here is what the servants are to be doing is basically keeping the household, keeping the business running while the master is away. So farming, supervising the servants in the field, uh, arranging trips to market with the produce, making sure everyone is paid for and looked after. Basically, they have to keep everything running and, and do all the things the master would be doing as if he were there and for him whilst he's not there. And Jesus says, if he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. So they didn't have clocks back then. And so they roughly split the day into hours. And the evening was split into three watches, roughly about four hours long, depending on the season. Um, basically chunks of time. And what Jesus is saying is, if they manage to stay awake and be ready even late into the night, even into the early morning, then how much more pleased the master will be. It's almost proof that they're really ready. I mean, if he comes at like two o'clock in the afternoon, like they really should be ready, shouldn't they? But if he comes late at night and they're ready, it's like, oh, you've really been looking out for me the whole time. And what a blessing there will be for those servants who are, uh, who are looking out for him when it's really quite hard to stay awake. Yeah? And then this is where the parable takes, really, a surprising turn. Because in Jesus' story, he says that if the master comes back with the servants who were waiting for him and who he's pleased with, he says the master will become a servant to his servants. Finding his servants ready, them looking out for him, running the household well, it overjoys him so much 
But he tucks his own robe into his belt, kneels around the table, washes their feet, serves them. Now for us, we're like, oh, like, this is just how every film should end, isn't it? You know, every story, you know, a heartwarming scene of late night fellowship. But for the people listening to Jesus, this was unthinkable. What master would ever wear servant's clothing? What master would ever make himself nothing by taking the form of a servant? Well, a master like Jesus, of course. In this parable, Jesus, the master is a picture of Jesus, who's going to be going away for a time after the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, but who will return. And the servants are those people who are called to do his work whilst he is absent. His disciples. His church. And what we see then is that Jesus is not a harsh master. He's a loving, caring master who wants to share his life with those who work with him. And so what would be unthinkable for anyone else was at the very heart of Jesus' mission to the world he is the master of the universe the lord of all creation yet he had come to serve his people by freeing them from death and sin and then interestingly jesus mixes his metaphor he's allowed to do that way you know in verse 39 you know he doesn't say if the servant had known what time the master was coming, he'd been ready. Instead, he chooses the metaphor of a thief. He says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man, for he is coming at an hour you do not expect. I have found that when people burgle your house, they don't generally send you a text message ahead of time. If they said, you know, oh, I'm going to pop around at 3.15 on Tuesday morning and I'm going to nick your bike out of the shed, well, uh, we'd have the police waiting, wouldn't we? Like, it wouldn't really be, it'd be easy to be ready for that. But Jesus says, you know, that, that's not what it's like, is it, when a thief comes? And that's not what it's going to be like when the Son of Man comes. Well, who's the Son of Man? Jesus says, when he says the Son of Man, he's talking about himself. He's already said this very clearly in Luke's Gospel. And the title, the title, The Son of Man, is from the book of Daniel. Do you remember that a fantastic image, prophecy, vision in the book of Daniel, where the Ancient of Days, the Father, is sitting on his throne, and the Son of Man comes to him, comes before him, and is given authority to judge. So when Jesus uses this title of himself in the context of his returning, at a time that they won't expect, everyone listening understands that he's talking about the judgment, the day of the Lord, when God will come and sort things out. Jesus is saying, like, the day of judgment, if you are hoping to wait until the last possible second to be ready for it, well, you're going to be caught out. Just like being ready for a thief. The only, to be re- the only way to be ready for a thief, the only way to be ready for the day of judgment is to always be ready for it. To live ready for it. Are you ready? Do you live each day ready for Jesus' return? Or do you sometimes give yourself a pass and play the odds? Do you ever say to yourself, I mean, like, you say, really, I mean, really, what are the odds that Jesus comes back today? And almost kind of count on him not, and kind of actually hope he doesn't. Do you ever think like that and and give yourself a pass to do whatever it is that you know you, you know you shouldn't be doing? Whether it's, you know, being greedy, overeating, being lazy, gossiping. Just watching trashy TV, fornicating, over-drinking, spending money recklessly, viewing things that you know you shouldn't be looking at. You do things that you would be literally mortified 
to be found doing if Jesus returns. But you play the odds. And you give yourself a pass, knowing, well, I can repent of it tomorrow when actually I'm going to feel really bad about it. I know I'm going to feel really bad about it tomorrow, but Jesus will forgive me. And I'm going to play the odds that he's not coming right now. That's not being ready. Being a Christian is not, it's not a one-time action of, you know, putting the hospital bag by the front door and then ignoring it and getting on with doing whatever you want. It's constant vigilance. Uh, before we had kids, or actually when we only had a couple, um, there were a few times when Rachel would go, uh, go home to visit family in York and I'd stay in Bridge End and have a week of quiet and get some studies done. And what I'd do is, the day she left, that afternoon, i clean the house from top to bottom, and then I know it's ready for when she comes back. It's like a one-time thing, clean it from top to bottom, then she's like, wash my dishes as I'm going along. It's, it's all done. But, when we had more kids, uh, and there was a time when Rach went to York, and she took two, and she left two with me in Worthing, different kettle of fish, <laughs> yeah? It was a constant keeping on top of things. If I clean it the first day, well, I have to clean it the second day and the third. And if I miss a day, well, the ore's got out of hand. And, uh, you know, it felt like the house would never be tidy again. And to be honest, I'm not sure we've ever quite caught up. Uh, <laughs> if I wanted the house to be ready for when Rachel came home, I had to keep it ready. To keep it ready. That is what being a Christian is like. Yes. We are saved by Jesus' once and for all work on the cross and in the tomb. But our work is daily. And that daily work is prayer, repentance, daily reading the scriptures. That is how we stay ready. It's, it's nothing complicated or clever. It's simply doing church life, being a Christian. Doing the things that Jesus would be doing if he were here. In his stead, we, we do it, actually we do it because he is here. In us, in church, in you. See, church really isn't a life of waiting, of, of, wait, uh, of only kind of waiting for things to happen. It's a life of doing. It starts now. We are meant to run things as if Jesus were here. Telling people the true danger of sin. Calling people to repent for the kingdom of God is near. Caring for the widow and the orphan. Constantly repenting of our... If Jesus was stood right here, first of all, you wouldn't do half the sin you, you do if he was walking around with you. And when you did, you'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I repent, please forgive me. Like, we'd do that constantly, wouldn't we? If he were here, that's what we're to do now. Pursuing godliness. Being constantly in prayer. And we stay ready by always believing it could be today. It could be right now. It could be right now. It could, yeah? Jesus could return today and I can't wait to greet him. I want him to, I want him to come today. I want him to find me today like this. So what do I want to be found doing when he returns? Faith isn't a hospital bag by the door. It's it's a daily cleaning the toilets. It's not, I said a prayer, I'm good, I'll just you know, ignore all this stuff till Jesus comes. It's daily scrubbing the soul in repentance. Constant vigilance and cleaning. Why? Because we love Jesus so much. We want his life. We can't wait for him to return. And so we live each day like, I hope it's today. It always makes me laugh. Um, like the way Sully greets me when I come home, you think I, I had died and rose again. Yeah? He's like waiting in the window. Ha, 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 you're back! It's like, I've just been literally to the shop for five minutes. No, but you're back! Are, are we like that? Jesus? And so Peter asks, a, a classic Peter, verse 41. Lord, are you telling this parable for us, for the disciples, or is it for everyone? In other words, so exactly who is this reward for, Jesus? Are you saying that if us disciples are ready, we're going to get a big special reward? And Jesus says, not necessarily. 
Luke 12.42 uh, And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master will set over his household, and give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. So Peter asks, um, so what you're saying is it's those of us in authority in your house that will get rewarded, right? And Jesus is like, no, it's whoever is faithful with what I've given them will be rewarded. Authority, position or, or gifting in church does not win favour with God. Only faithfulness with what he's given you will. Whether it be a little or whether it be a lot. And so, so Jesus gives a warning against thinking that authority now, or life going well now, means blessing later. Verse 45, But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect it, and an hour which he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Now, in its original context, this is clearly a shot at the chief priests and the rulers of the temple, because this is exactly what they had done. By this point in history, 90% uh, of the privately owned farmlands, so not what had already been taken by Rome, but 90% of the farmland that Israel owned was owned by the temple, by the priests personally. So the Sadducees and the chief priests, what they'd done was they leveraged the temple tax against the people. They'd made the tax so high that they couldn't pay it. And they go, well, we'll take your land instead. This is land that had belonged to each of these families since Moses, that God had allotted to these families. And the high priest had gone and made it so that he could take it from them. The managers were abusing the servants in their care. And so this passage is a warning for church leaders, for pastors. Jesus says in verse 47 that the servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Jesus says that there are other leaders in the world who treat those under them poorly. He was talking about the Romans, the Greek, the Egyptians. We can think of world leaders today, couldn't we? We can think of organisations that don't look after employees. Yeah? But these church leaders then and these church leaders now um, so the Egyptians, uh, 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 they, didn't, they didn't have the Torah. They didn't have the law. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have the priesthood. And so when they go and sin, it's in some degree in ignorance. Not complete ignorance, but in some degree in ignorance. Now Jesus doesn't say, therefore, they get off the hook. He doesn't say there's no judgment for them because they're ignorant. He's saying, no, it's going to be less severe than the judgment that will be received by those who do have the law and who have studied the Torah and knew exactly what God would have them do and yet still did the exact opposite. So this is the thing we take really seriously in church. In a lot of kind of evangelicalism, we often make a big point about you know, the pastors being just like everybody else. You know, like that kind of, oh, well... What you think about church is just as equal as what we think about it. And so, you know, we'll just all have a big vote about stuff and we'll all decide together. Because heaven forbid we should have any real structure in church. Often, we lower the office of pastor to be just like every church member. But it's not. The office is not. Yes, of course, right, me and Viv, we are sinners just like you. Sometimes we're even bigger sinners than you, I'm sure. We need God's gracious means applied to our lives just like everyone else. We receive no special favour from the Lord than anybody else does. And yes, we can be wrong and need to be corrected just like everyone else does. 
But we are not going to be judged just like everyone else is. We're going to be judged more harshly. And that is in part, that is in part because I've had the privilege of three years of formal seminary education, followed by four years of training in a church, and then another four of study as I planted this church every day in the scriptures. That's what I'm set aside for. I get to do what you don't get to do for you. Reading and praying. See, when you stand before God, you will have to answer for what you believe and what you have done and how you, you know, particularly fathers and husbands, how you've cared for those under you. When I stand before God, I not only have to answer for myself, but I will have to answer for, on some level, what you believe. I will have to answer for how you have lived. And did I help you or hinder you in following Jesus? Did I make it clear to you what it means to, follow, to walk with Jesus? Did I call you to faithfulness? Did I equip you to live faithfully? And did I warn you about the dangers of, of unfaithfulness? And I take that really seriously. And this is why at times you might think that me and Viv are kind of hounding you about coming to prayer meeting and coming to Bible study and serving in church ministries evangelistically and being in church every week. It's because we love you and we want you to walk with Jesus and be ready for when he comes. This is why when I had understood what the scriptures said about the sacraments, I couldn't just sit on it and ignore it. Some of you might not like the decisions that me and Viv make. You might like it if we did church in a different way or a different style. Sometimes I would prefer we did church in a different way or a different style to my own preferences. But we do things the way God has called us to and the way he's shown us to. It's why James says, not many of you should become teachers because it's harsher. Peter heard what Jesus said and was focused on the reward parts. He's saying, are you saying if we are faithful, we're going to get a big reward? And and Jesus doesn't say no. He says, yes, blessed is the one who is found awake. But you might want to be more concerned about the fact that there's also the possibility of a greater punishment for you. If you want this position of, of authority and blessing, you better use it properly. And this, whilst it particularly applies to pastors, you guys aren't off the hook. It applies to us all. It applies to us all. Verse 48, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will be demanded more. Everyone. Everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. Ask yourself, what have you been given? What have you been given? Is it a little or is it a lot? What have you been given? Your money, your resources, your fertility, your relationships, your marriage, your children, your intelligence, your singleness. All of it is given to you by God. All of it comes from God to you for a time. What are you going to do with it? Because you will have to answer to God for what you have done with it. Now, you might think, well, I don't really have any of those. I don't really feel rich in those ways at all. But actually, if you're sat here this morning, you have been given much. We tend to forget the things that we have been given that previous generations of Christians have not had. No generation of Christian before us has had the access to the Bible like we have today. No generation has access to the teaching we have today. We can go online at any time, day or night, and read the church fathers. I mean, instead, we, we go and look at pictures of cats, right? We can attend church often and freely, and yet often we will choose to watch TV or do whatever we want to do. That day when we stand before Jesus, we will have to give an account, not just morally and ethically, 
but we have to give account of everything, what we've done with everything that God has given us, which in our case is an awful lot. These are matters for deep self-examination. Do I believe that Jesus is coming soon? Or do I live as though he's been delayed? Am I using my possessions for the good of others and the glory of God? Or am I careless in my stewardship, using things mainly for myself? And maybe, you know, a few other bits that's left over for God. Am I teaching others the grace of God? Or am I actually quite silent about my faith? These questions are good tests of our readiness for Christ's return. Here's another good test to use throughout the day. Ask yourself, am I a faithful servant or would I be embarrassed if Jesus returned right now and found me doing what I'm doing, saying what I'm saying and thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> We'd be well chuffed if he turned up now, wouldn't we? We'd be well chuffed if he turned up on a Sunday morning Look, Jesus, we're worshipping you. We're all about... All, I do this every day of the week, Jesus. Yeah? Look, I'm about your house. Boy, would we look good. What about the rest of the week? Like, this is like a few hours on a Sunday morning. I don't, I don't know, right? Because Jesus says we don't know. But I don't think he's coming back on a Sunday morning. Is the rest of our week a reflection of our life on Sunday? We should be looking at us during the week and go, oh, that makes sense that they, they go to church on Sunday. And they, or they're like, that doesn't, that doesn't match up. What about our children? How are we preparing our children for that day when Jesus returns? Because we, we, we need to prepare them. We, we're responsible for them. Are we, we, you know, I will have to answer for all you lot. But if you're a parent... You'll have to answer for them. And if you're grown up in this church, if you're not their biological parent, you'll be asked to answer because a load of them, we baptised them and you all said a load of things that promised to care for them. How, how seriously do we take getting our children ready? Are we, what do we talk about most with them? What do we teach them to be focused on, to be vigilant for? How are we preparing to be ready? Are we pushing Jesus or grades, Jesus or popularity? Jesus or success, Jesus or sports, Jesus or lots of money in the bank. Revelation speaks of Babylon as a woman. The, the spirit of this world is being a whore, a harlot. And it speaks of her wine that she goes around and gets the world leaders drunk with and gets the, the people drunk with, the, the wine of her pleasures and treasures. And because she holds it out, she's like, oh, it's so good. It will, it, it, it will give you life. And so much of this world will promise you life, you know, work, sex, money, possessions, financial security, the right home, the right holiday. Get all these things and you'll have life. So many things will promise you that. So many things will promise you to, to keep you alive and to make you awake. But awake to what? See, fornication may make you awake but it'll wake you up only to the passions of your own flesh. Drunkenness may make you awake to the, the fun of carefreeness and negligence. Money will make you awake to the pleasure of possessions. These things do indeed wake you up to something, your own desires, your own flesh, but they don't wake you up to Jesus. They don't wake you up to real life. They put you in a drunken stupor where you think, oh, this is all great. I'm having the best night of my life. And everyone's looking at you like, you're just on the floor in a pile of your own vomit. Seriously? This is a good time? That's what we are as Christians. We're sober. We look at the world and they're drunk off their faces. And they think that it's great. And they're choking on their own tongue. And we're the ones that are trying to drive them home safely and get them to Jesus. We need to stay sober. We stay awake. We need a deep work of Jesus in us. And it doesn't just happen. He, yeah, he, he gives us his Holy Spirit, but he doesn't just zap us with faith. It's a constant walking with him every day. We need to be about his word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be together, pressing on. 
These parables about servants and masters are some of the weightiest parables in the Gospels. They bring us face to face with our destiny and show us that we all need a saviour. Because whether we are more or, or less ignorant, uh, and whether we have been more or less faithful, we have all been neglectful of our stewardship. Who can say, oh, I know, I've always been ready. Or, I've always made the best use of what I have, of all the good things God has given me. Or that, you know, who can say, I've always lived every single day in perfect expectation of the coming of Jesus. Nobody. That's why we need a saviour. That's why we need Jesus. See, Jesus, he is the true and faithful servant. Who took all of our unfaithfulness upon himself. When he died on the cross and then he buried it and left it in the grave before coming back to life. You see, in one sense, Christianity should be, a, should be a religion full of faithful servants. But Christianity is not a religion for faithful servants. But a gospel, the good news for unfaithful servants. It is the power to change. It is the gift to stay awake and to be made ready. It is the power to reject laziness and self-interest so that we may truly be excited and we may truly be looking for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. All glory be to Jesus. Amen.